work of Sigmund Freud is one of the most important intellectual projects of the early 20th century. And its importance lies in several related factors. But perhaps the, the fundamental importance of Freud is that it brings together two incompatible or perhaps antagonistic trains of German late 19th century, early 20th century thought. And the two strains that it brings together are positivism, the kind of rigid scientific materialism characteristic of late 19th century German science, which was championed by people like Mach and Avenarius. And also the other theme or trend which it brings together is the trend of German speculation, which I think it has its origin back in the traditions of German idealism, but which is transformed in the late 19th century by figures like Brentano, who try and construct a, a psychology, a logos of the psyche, a discipline which discusses internal mental events rather than external objective events. What Freud does, to his credit, is find a way of walking this tightrope of bringing together both elements of scientific positivistic objectivity and a concern to discuss facts of the human psyche which are inaccessible to direct psychiat or to direct physical or scientific examination. So Freud has a foot in both camps. He is not a pure idealist, even though he deals with mental phenomena. He is not a pure materialist, even though he ultimately believes that mental phenomena can be reduced to physical facts. So he wants to have his cake and eat it too. The degree to which he manages to connect these themes is um, one of the reasons why his work has been so influential. Because commonsensically, all of us have a sense that the world is a physical thing studied by science. But we also experience the world in such a way that it's hard to talk about our experiences entirely in terms of a reductive scientific language. We feel love and hate. We feel guilt and pleasure. And it's hard to turn that into F equals MA. Freud manages to straddle both. Now let's think about Freud's conception of the self. It's derived from the tradition of Western philosophy, particularly the one that comes out of Descartes. And we have to think just a little bit about Descartes to see why Freud is important, why it's a big change. For Descartes, who is the philosopher of systematic skepticism, the one thing that he couldn't be doubtful of, the one thing that he couldn't call into question was his own existence. Introspection for Descartes, looking into the contents of your own mind, of your own experience, was privileged and transparent. In other words, from Descartes' view, if you don't know what's going on inside your head, who does? Which is a very sensible idea. The problem that Freud offers us is that perhaps our introspection, perhaps our knowledge of ourself, is not clear, is not transparent, that it is systematically unreliable data. So what happens here is this. Freud takes the Cartesian cogito, the self, the observer uh, of Western philosophy that founds Western science, and splits it. What we get here is a splitting of the subject. And this is almost perfectly analogous to the splitting of the atom, which is happening at just about the same time. In one case, we split the fundamental unit of matter and generate new and interesting epistemological problems from that splitting of our, inter of our, our integral unit. Well, what Freud does is split the integral unit of the psyche. He splits the subject into its component parts, like splitting the atom of our mental world. And strangely enough, it generates unusual and previously undiscovered epistemological problems. Now let's go back to this difficulty. The Cartesian cogito is easy to understand. You look inside yourself, and you know what's, uh, what's there, and you know what you're doing, you know how it works. Freud says, suppose you don't know yourself. Where does that leave us? That makes our, the active introspection, radically ambiguous. What shall we do now? How are we going to interpret that raw data? Because we definitely have senses. We have fears and loves and hates and lusts and all kinds of emotions. How are we supposed to interpret that if we don't know it in any kind of certain way? If it's distorted, how are we going to find our way out of that labyrinth? Well, Freud works on this problem. And what he decides to do is to try and find the deep structure of the human soul, particularly the structure of the soul which we don't disclose to ourselves. And you can make the analogy back to Descartes. For Descartes, since, the in, since your knowledge of your mind is transparent and obvious, the big problem then epistemologically is how do you find out about other minds? Right? Descartes has a real problem climbing out of his own shell of the psyche and finding out about how you feel and you feel and you feel. Very difficult. Well, Freud changes that problem. He says the problem isn't to know other minds. The problem is to know your own. But if you were to crack that code and find out how to know your own mind, that would also be the skeleton key to knowing other minds. So although he makes the Cartesian problem harder, if it is soluble for the self, it is soluble for all people. A great epistemological breakthrough if it works. Okay? It's an impressive achievement and a nice little intellectual gambit. Right? This is another reason why he's so influential. He's extremely imaginative right? in a way that you, you can't directly expect of linear logical science. 
Now, what Freud wants to do is construct a scheme of translation between what the manifest content of your experiences are and the latent content. In other words, between the surface structure and the deep structure. If you have a dream about uh, fighting Mike Tyson, well, that's the surface structure, but the latent structure of that may be that you're dreaming, you're displacing your feelings about your boss or about politics or about some other authority structure, and that what you're doing is, symbol is symbolically re-representing something which causes you great anxiety. Well, what Freud thinks he can do is show us, he can give us a kind of algorithm for the various kinds of transformations that the unconscious undergoes or makes itself undergo, which generate the manifest structure of our consciousness. So what it is then, from Freud's perspective, is that the self is a kind of a code. And that once you crack this code, then you can translate communicative behaviors that had not previously been thought of as being communicative, and you can look at communicative behavior like speech as being communicative in a new and different way. So Freud, like anybody, believes that speech is a kind of communication. But what's great about this translation scheme is that it allows us to move from various kinds of behaviors which had previously been thought meaningless and to literally read them as being symbols. So if someone spends all day washing their hands, 15, 20, 30 times a day they wash their hands, nobody gets that dirty. This is not simply an objective fact about the world. It is a symbolic representation of some sort of unconscious activity. So what Freud does, what's brilliant about this, is that he reads, rather than merely looks at, certain kinds of behavior which we might not otherwise have thought communicated anything. That's the deep point here, and that's why in many respects this is a very impressive achievement. So we're going to look for this translation scheme, and once he finds it, Freud is going to extrapolate from this translation scheme and from this model of the psyche to all kinds of other mat matters, to questions of art, culture, and what, among other things, what he's going to generate is a sort of very pessimistic kind of social philosophy. He'll view religion as a giant anxiety neurosis. He'll view uh, the human ego or the human self as not being Rousseauian and nice when you get born, exactly the opposite. He'll treat the individual human ego as completely driven by the pleasure principle until the reality principle intervenes. We are tyrannical machines for absorbing pleasure when we get born. We only get civilized and made social by the process of bumping into reality. So it's an anti-Rousseauian, anti-optimistic, rather pessimistic view of the human condition. Civilization causes us discontents, but God knows we wouldn't want to live without it. Then we would be pure monsters of desire. All right. So Freud connects this conception of the self with the conception of society. The connection between self and society, the extrapolation from one to the other, is at least as old as Plato. All right, so you can't ignore the fact that there's a social philosophy connected with this that is in many respects not just an epiphenomenon but an important element of it. Now let's look at the development of Freud's work itself. Freud was a brilliant student, always an outstanding scholar in school, and he studied both under positivists like Helmholtz and Bruca, but also under Franz Brentano after he got his PhD or after he got his uh, medical degree. And Brentano is very important. He's not uh, usually read anymore. He's kind of a secondary figure in the history of philosophy, but why? he's important as a teacher. He was Freud's teacher. He was also Edmund Husserl's teacher. And he was the teacher of a, no of a number of influential German intellectuals at the end of the 19th century. And what Brentano added to Freud's positivistic, hard shell um, materialism is a certain fact or a certain set of assertions about the mind. Brentano said this. He said, look, I like science as much as the next man, but the problem is, is that the intentional qualities of the psyche can't be eliminated. In other words, they're here to stay. Guilt and anger and fear and love and lust and all the stuff that's going on in your head, that doesn't ultimately reduce to, to F equals MA. Now, Freud thinks that in the long run it will. In other words, it's some sort of, he, he genuflects to the idea of positivistic reduction as one of the regulative rules of science. Brentano was more like an idealist. He says, look, never the twain shall meet. We have objective reality and subjective reality, and we talk about them with different kinds of vocabularies. Well, scientific people like Freud tend to think that, no, the world is all one homogenous thing, in theory. And in theory, our psychic life ought to be reducible to biochemical events. Sensible enough. Most of us believe that now. But in some respects, this idea is a bluff. And this is why Brentano is a very important influence on Freud and other thinkers. He says, look, maybe a thousand centuries from now, our science will be advanced enough so that we can actually describe guilt or lust or rage in terms of biochemical events and synaptic firings. But for now, it's a bluff. 
We don't know how to do that. We're not going to find out how to do that anytime soon. And between now and a thousand centuries from now, we may want to talk about the internal aspects of our experience. We may want to talk about good and evil and love and hate and lust and guilt and all that other stuff. Why wait until our science really does the job? A very sensible observation. Right? So while Brentano will hold in theory that this is a special realm of discourse, Freud will say it's not special. Really, ultimately, it will reduce down to physics. And then after genuflecting at the altar of physics, then he runs away and talks about things like the Oedipus complex, lust and rage and guilt, which don't reduce to physics. All right? So Freud wants it both ways. And this causes a very rich sort of ambiguity in his work, which is one of the reasons why it's so fruitful. And also one of the reasons why it gives rise to so many multivocal interpretations. Because this tension never really gets resolved, there are a lot of different ways you might want to choose to read this. Right? There are some cases in which ambiguity is useful rather than a, an impediment to thought. All right. So now, Freud is looking at the internal contents of the mind, and he's a, he's a medical doctor, and he's interested in the kind of physical basis of it as well. And one of his early uh, post-schooling uh, treatments, when he went to, to study uh, further and become a, a, a sort of mental or neurological specialist, he studied with Charcot, he studied with uh, uh, Breuer, he studied with a number of leading figures in the scientific study of the mind, and particularly what, occur what interested these figures, these gentlemen, was hysteria. Women, particularly upper middle class women in Vienna and in the, the more affluent parts of Europe, seemed to be coming down with a kind of disease that didn't seem to have any organic source. These women were having uh, psychosomatic paralysis of parts of the body. They would break into hysterical laughter. They would take to bed with obscure illnesses that no one could find an organic foundation for. And Freud said, and Charcot said, and Breuer said, what is this? What's going on here? What kind of a disease is it that doesn't seem to be part of the body? And the answer, derived from Brentano, is that perhaps it's some sort of disease of the mind. Further evidence suggested that talking to these people was a very important thing. When you put these women under hypnosis, they would lose their psychosomatic paralysis and all their symptoms would disappear. And Freud thought that a very peculiar thing because, well, if this is a material problem, well then why is it that talking to them, doing something non or uh, non-chemical uh, non gets this practical physical result? He thought about it for a while and didn't come to any completely satisfactory uh, conclusion, but what he did, uh, he published in 1895 the studies in hysteria on Anna O. Oh. He studied, publishes that with Breuer. And then the same year, a little bit thereafter, he works out his seduction theory of hysteria. Right? The idea is that these hysterical women are hysterical because earlier in their life they had been somehow sexually traumatized by some figure in their family and that they had repressed these memories and now that these memories were unconsciously being symbolized in these symptoms. Now look here at the idea of the unconscious. The unconscious is what bridges the gap between the child and the adult. That's why it's going to be very fruitful for generating a theory of neurosis. The difficulty that he encountered is that so many of these women seemed to claim early childhood sexual abuse that he thought it was phony. After thinking about it, he said, you know, this is probably a fantasy on their part. Probably this didn't happen. Now, there's been recently quite a bit of controversy about this. And I won't enter into this controversy because of the fact that I don't think it's a knowable proposition. These women that Freud talked to, were they or were they not really sexually abused? Frankly, I don't know. The evidence we have is just inconclusive. It is possible to read it either way. Or, more likely, some of them probably were telling the truth, some of them probably weren't, and we don't have one logical decision procedure which allows us to find out who's who. So you have to kind of take it as it comes and do the best you can with it. This is going to be one of the characteristic difficulties with Freudianism. Right? It's more a hermeneutic, a principle of interpretation, than it is a science. And the difficulty that emerges is that principles of interpretation offer a, different, offer a realm of possible interpretations. So what Freud does is vacillates for a while about the origins of hysteria and then comes up with the idea that it's not a question of seduction, rather it's the projection of these women's unconscious sexual fantasies. Right? And that's the difficulty. There's some sort of blockage in the this, this, this sexual energy. Also, you'll notice when you read Freud, I mean, while I'm on the topic of energy, is that he makes use of many hydraulic metaphors. I would emphasize that these are metaphors. In other words, psychic energy Right, is not energy in the sense that light is energy or electricity is energy. Right? It's a metaphorical sort of an energy. It's a mental energy. So be careful when we're being metaphorical about this. Do not literalize the metaphors. Many of the mistaken biological readings of Freud come from literalizing these metaphors. Let's think about this now. Their psychic energy is blocked and they have unconscious sexual longings which are made, which are made into these hysterical symptoms. How are we supposed to solve this problem? The talking cure emerges. 
Freud finds, along with Breuer, that when you get to talk to these women, you ask them, what's going on in your mind? How do you feel? What is it that's upsetting you? When they discuss these things, they get a sort of catharsis. And this catharsis, at least in some cases, caused the remission of the symptoms. The conclusion that Freud draws is that these symptoms are a sort of symbolic representation of your unconscious sexual desires. When you find a verbal way of symbolizing these sexual desires, you no longer need to symbolize them as hysteria. And thus, we have the beginnings of the cathartic talking cure. Now, from his work on hysteria and his work on the talking cure, he starts uh, uh, another big phase in his life when his father dies in 96. Freud then begins his own, what he calls, self-analysis, which is a very important thing because introspection is ultimately going to be the foundation of every psychology. Even though many psychologists would like not to say so, they are all ultimately founded on their experiences themselves. What else could it be founded upon? And this begs some questions that I'll bring up later with regard to how one goes about analyzing oneself. Right, and there are some very fishy intellectual moves involved in being the only one for whom the unconscious is transparent. But I'll bracket that for now and come back to the end. Let's assume that he does, as it actually historically happens, analyze himself, come up with an idea of what his real motives are and what everyone's motives are. From here, he begins his work on dreams. And this is one of the great achievements. His book, uh, The Interpretation of Dreams, written in one burst uh, of tremendous energy uh, in 1899. And what he does is argue this. He says that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. It is in dreams where we project our otherwise censored feelings. So dreams are a way of expressing our unconscious wishes. And these wishes are almost always sexual in nature. Right? So it's wish fulfillment. Now in children, dreams are real straightforward. They dream about a mountain of candy. Why? Because they would like a mountain of candy. It's real easy to figure out how children dream, children's dreams work. Wish fulfillment. With adults, when the superego gets added to your psyche so that you begin to feel ashamed or uncomfortable or guilty about your sexual longings, these things are transposed or displaced or symbolically reformulated. So what happens is, is that during waking hours, the, su uh, the sensor in our mind, the superego, doesn't allow these uncomfortable thoughts in. Uh, say thoughts, uh, edible thoughts about killing your father and having sex with your mother or your siblings. or something that would be a great transgression. Well, your waking mind won't allow you to acknowledge the fact that you have these longings. But when the superego goes to sleep, it's possible for these things to get expressed in your dreams, in your sleeping life. And what this does is remove some of the pressure from the mechanisms of repression, which might become overloaded in working life. In other words, there's a sort of economy of the psyche. Right? And, what, and it tries to maintain a sort of dynamic equilibrium between your waking life, in which the superego directs you to various kinds of activities and you integrate all your desires using the ego, and your sleeping life, in which case we have the sort of bacchanalia of the id. All your aggressive and, and sexual desires come out because God knows they need to come out somewhere. If you repress them too much, it will cause a breakdown of your mechanisms of defense. Okay, so in the interpretation of dreams, what we find out is that we're going to release this sexual pressure and the dreams, if they're analyzed properly, will show themselves as symbolic transformations of longings. Note how the unconscious functions here. It's a sort of algebraic transformation between the manifest data of your, of your uh, dreams and the latent unconscious data of your real psychic life. So we get this sort of transformation, and then we get introduced Technical ideas like displacement and transformation and condensation and overdetermination. The idea is something like this. Your dreams are very economical means by which your longings are expressed. So if you have a dream about, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, fighting a tiger, the tiger may be your, the pr some problem that you're working on intellectually. It may be your wife. It may be your boss. It may be your kids. It may be a lot of things. Not only may it be any of those things, but it may be all of those things. Because of the process of condensation, we bring two or three or four different psychic states, uh, unacceptable longings, into one f uh, symbolic structure. All right? This is called condensation, and it's connected with the idea of overdetermination. All right? yeah, your dreams are overdetermined. They have more than one cause. It's a plurality of causes here. This is a I mean, intuitively true idea. It seems very plausible. It's going to cause a certain epistemological problems later when we look at it. Now, from dreams and the idea that dreams are a reflection of the unconscious, we managed to get a connection then between hysteria and dreams, two things that most people would never have thought to connect. And now we're going to connect it with a third thing that's even more interesting, parapraxis. Parapraxis is the complicated name for mistakes. Right? People make mistakes all the time. 
Freud develops in 1905, or actually in the early parts of, of that decade, um, 1901 he publishes uh, Jokes in Their Relation to the Unconscious, 1905 he publishes uh, uh, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, and what he says here is this, the mistakes that you make are another symbolic representation of your unconscious desires. So when you forget someone's name, it's not that that's an accident on your part. It's not your memory just failing arbitrarily. That is a meaningful activity. And he reads that as being your dislike of the person whose name you have forgotten. You don't want to admit that you don't like them, so you just forget them and say, oh my, oh me, I don't remember that person's name. Freud thinks it's fishy. Or if you say, uh, I suppose I were to call Dr. Freud, Dr. Fraud, accidentally, if there were a slip of the tongue. Well, Freud would say, ah, uh -huh, no, no, that is not a, a mistake of your palate. That is a mistake of your psyche. Right, and you're really saying something about what you think this intellectual activity is. There are no mere mistakes. So what Freud says is that so slips are Freudian, that they are ways of symbolic representing unconscious wishes that you don't even know you have, which is what connects parapraxis to dreams to hysteria. All of them are symptoms of the unconscious. Freud is reading the whole domain of human behavior as a language or a set of languages, which is the code in which the unconscious discloses itself. A very brilliant and deep way of bringing together a surprisingly heterogeneous number of things. Who would have thought the slips of the tongue were really a kind of dream, which were really a kind of hysteria? It's an interesting thought. All right. So we get these parapraxies, and then from there, he develops, I mean, the next stage in his intellectual development is the development of, intellect, of infantile sexuality, which at the time was one of the most controversial of Freud's ideas. Freud believes, I mean, since he gives up on this Rousseauian optimistic view of human nature, that human beings are little monsters of desire, and they want, they want, they want, they want. They want a bottle, they want to be changed, they want to be warm, they want to be held, they want to be taken care of, they want to go to sleep, they want to wake up. They want, they want, they want, they want, they want. And they are not corrupted by society, rather society civilizes them and tames them and turns, turns them into social animals. Well, the infant is driven by the pleasure principle, the desire for pleasure, and Freud plays kind of fast and loose with the idea here of sexuality. For, for, for most of us, sexuality is um, something is an adult activity, right? I mean, almost by definition, you have to go through puberty to have what we call as usual technical, specific uh, sexual activity. Freud says no. He means sexuality in the large, extended sense of pleasure. Right? And you have to be very careful when you read Freud because it's easy to think, well, I mean, what is the sex life of a baby? Well, the sex life of a baby is things like drinking its bottle, longing for the breast, longing for warmth. It's, uh, what he means by sexuality is pleasure. So he says that human beings necessarily go through definite stages of development. They move from the anal to the oral to the genital phase. The genital phase, the final phase of sexual development, is adult, healthy sexuality. And this is the pursuit of pleasure which is both natural and socially desirable, satisfactory. And from this, from the idea of infantile sexuality and the genetic structure of psychic development, Freud then puts together a full-blown theory of the unconscious, which is kind of the, the heart of his system. Right. The key thing about the unconscious is not that Freud offers us that idea. Actually, that's an old idea. It's a borrowing. Um, it's at least as old as Schopenhauer, the idea that human beings have an unconscious. So Freud didn't develop that. What's revolutionary and interesting about Freud is the fact that he offers us not just the unconscious, but he says that there are law-like behavior of the unconscious, which I can explain to you. In other words, it is not arbitrary or chaotic. It is not idiomatic or subjective, all of our unconscious activities, the, the unconscious element of our mind, have a common structure which can be discerned. That's why all of our mistakes refer back to our specific unconscious activities. Our dreams, even though your dreams are different from mine, refer back uh, isomorphically to your unconscious. So the unconscious works by certain definable laws. That's what Freud's great achievement is in, as far as he's concerned. Um, by the time he gets to 1923 with the new introductory lectures on psycho psychoanalysis, he's got a general model of the mind, the three-part model of the mind, the id, the ego, and the superego, which is very well known and kind of one of the kind of um, basic points of Freudianism. First of all, that's not new either, right? Just think of, of Plato's idea of gold, silver, and bronze, right? They isomorphically connect very nicely. Think of the old Christian idea of God, man, and the devil. <laughs> They're really isomorphically the same thing, and they all take up about the same amount of space. Right? What they are is symbolic ways of representing different psychic attitudes. Right? One is, the, uh, or the first two are the product of pre-scientific societies. Freud is the product of 19th and early 20th century Germany. But what it really is is a reformulation of the same basic ideas. We have drives towards sociality and towards what we might call moral behavior, which is the superego, or God, or the gold in Plato. And we have drives towards sex and death, 
which is the id in Freud, but it's also the devil in Christianity, and it's also the bronze in Platonism. All amount to the same thing. All are structures of the soul. Well, Freud gives us this three-part model, and then he goes on to discuss defense mechanisms later in the 20s, because when the ego confronts the world, it wants to operate on the pleasure principle. It wants to gratify its intrinsic natural desires, but it keeps on running up into barri barriers and impediments to that. You cannot have sex with everybody you want. I mean, just do the math. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, you can't have all the food in the world. You cannot have all the drink in the world. Even though you might want an infinite amount of pleasure, it's not possible. When we encounter the reality principle and our desires are frustrated, we generate defense mechanisms. Right? And so Freud actually gives us the details of the, way, of the various algorithms by which we distort our consciousness through these defense mechanisms. Right? So what we get here is a big form that Freud alleges is true for all psyches and the way in which they interact with the world. They're they are kind of oscillation between the pleasure principle and the reality principle. Now, towards the end of his life, Freud begins to put together uh, a kind of pessimistic social and political thought, which is the extrapolation of some of these ideas of the individual and the inevitable frustrations that, that society offers us. First off, one of the most important ideas is in 1927, the future of an illusion. The argument that Freud makes is that the monotheism of Judaism and Christianity and Islam is, in fact, a, a really an infantile neurosis. It's an inflated desire for a permanent universal daddy. God is the big sky daddy that supervises everything and runs everything. He's omnipotent and omniscient and he's just a wonderful guy, just the way you thought your daddy was when you were one. Now the difficulty is, is that individual human beings stop being one eventually and they no longer think that their daddy is omnipotent or omniscient and they no longer think he's the best daddy in the world, they no longer think he's the only daddy in the world and they realize he's just like you, he's a daddy but I mean the way of all flesh, it's all really the same. Well what Freud says is that we project our unconscious longings for uh, love, moral security, moral order. Um, we react to, our, to the pleasure principle, to our desire to believe this rather than the reality principle which says look there's no such thing. Freud was very influenced by Nietzsche. He had a great admiration for Nietzsche. And there's the same ruthless Nietzschean drive towards the dissolution of our happy illusions. One of the things that Freud wants us to do, and this is something worth thinking about, uh, Freud is sometimes read as a kind of crude moral hedonist. And there's a good bit of that in here. But I don't think that's an entirely fair reading. I believe that Freud is primarily concerned with the Delphic oracle and its utterance that we ought to know ourselves. What Freud wants us to do is say, stop being enslaved by the, pressure, by the pleasure principle. Let me bring you to the reality principle. Let me tell you what you really are. I know you don't want to believe this, and I actually have a name for the fact that you don't want to believe this. It's called resistance. But the fact that I see resistance, resistance is a sort of bird dog. Do you know when, when someone goes hunting and you get a dog to find the, a bird that you can't see? Well, Dr. Freud talks to you until he finds resistance, and as soon as he finds resistance, that's the bird dog that points to your unconscious longings. Points out every time. There's never, whenever, the, whenever you see resistance, it's always pointing to something you can't see, but when Dr. Freud walks in there, up comes the bird. Up comes those unconscious feelings. Well, it's possible to read Freud as a crude moral hedonist, but I think that that's not entirely fair. What actually happens is that Freud wants us to know ourselves, and he thinks that truth is more important than pleasure, ultimately. Um, this is obviously, in some ways, quite a grim philosophy. It is not a very edifying or pleasing set of... Uh, uh, organization of information about ourselves. But he says, come to yourself and stop kidding yourself. Stop believing there's a daddy in the sky. Come on, this is ridiculous. You're adults. Right? And you can kind of see how, yeah, we are anxious about moral order, and we do tend to project our longings for, for morality and for unity and for meaning onto the world. But Freud says, let us remove the pleasure principle and, and encounter the reality principle. It's a very fine thought. And I think that that does justice to him. You know, it's easy to kind of re read it in a reductive, hedonistic way. Well. After the future of an illusion, Freud then puts together one of his great little books. He's a master of the little work. And this is called Civilization and its Discontents. And what goes on in Civilization and Discontents is that Freud says, here's the problem. We all want these pleasures and we all have these desires, mostly sex and aggression. And in order for civilization to exist, we have to systematically frustrate these desires. In other words, you can't satisfy your desires outside of civilization. Right? I mean, Hobbes is right. I mean, in the state of nature, people, people's lives are, nas sh are nasty, brutish, and short. So in, or in order to have any kind of human existence, you need society, you need civilization, but civilization is going to tell you stuff like, you can't have sex with your parents, you can't have sex with your siblings, and you can't have sex with your children. That's called incest, and we don't allow that. 
And what Freud says is the problem is that people are constructed so that they want this. And he says, look, if people were not constructed so that they desired it, we wouldn't have a universal taboo against it. Note that when we look at it anthropologically through all cultures, we don't find a taboo against sprouting wings and flying. And the reason why we don't have a taboo against that is because nobody ever does it. We have a taboo against incest everywhere because people always have a desire to do that. Elsewise, it would be superfluous. He's right about that. So if this is not superfluous, but actually is, an, is a, a reflection of intrinsic human nature, what that means is that we are in a sort of double bind. We cannot find happiness outside of civilization, and alas, we cannot find happiness within it. So there's a deep pessimism here. There is an idea that the conflict between the individual and society ultimately can't be resolved. We find various way stations. And the best you're ever going to do, apparently according to Freud, is sublimation. Some small percentage of society is so gifted that they are able to take their unconscious sexual and aggressive desires and sublimate them, transform them into something creative and beautiful and, and uh, socially desirable. This would be called things like art, religion and philosophy. In other words, he's going to say that all the great artists are wounded, distorted psyches that are compensating for various kinds of psychic defects by projecting this beautiful stuff onto the Sistine Chapel. There is an argument to be made for that, although perhaps it is a little bit reductive. It is not at all clear that that's what all art is, sublimation of sexual desires. But even to bracket that problem, most people don't have that kind of talent. Most people simply don't have the possibility of sublimating their sexual desires in art or philosophy. Maybe you can get them to sublimate it in things like football on Sunday afternoons. A bunch of men feel aggressive and they don't want to go back to, to work feeling that way, so they all watch real big guys beat up each other, get a catharsis for their aggressive feelings, and then they don't, that way they don't punch out the boss Monday morning. Right? So that kind of sublimation, you can see how that might be a kind of way of channeling aggression in socially useful ways. The difficulty is, is that there is always a residue left over. We never perfectly do that. And this conflict, this, this leftover residue of unsatisfied longings, which are not only unsatisfied but unsatisfiable, that's the human condition. And there is a sort of grim anti-Rousseauian implication there. Uh, Rousseau wants to fundamentally change society. Why? Because we're all corrupted by an evil world. Freud says, look, you were evil to begin with. The world did with you what it could, and it made you better than you would be, and even that's not very good. Right? So there's a real negative kind of an emphasis here. And it shouldn't be seen as an epiphenomenon to Freud. The social theory is built right into the theory of the individual psyche. Now, before I leave you, I, I think I want to talk about some of the difficulties here. And there are many of them. And I tried to give a, a kind of uh, an appreciation, not just a criticism of Freud, because there's a lot here that is worthwhile. But I think, first off, that, there, that all the biological, positivistic, scientistic readings of Freud are all wrong. So everybody who wants Freud to be a scientist, I just think that's completely impossible. And I think it's a, I mean, it's a big misreading. And I think once we get beyond that misreading, we can really begin to appreciate him. So let's the, first of all think about the problem of falsifiability. Karl Popper and the whole school of Vienna, Vienna Circle, and the later neo-positivistic kind of thinkers all have a common set of objections to things like Freudian psychology. They say, how can you test this? Can you falsify it? The argument is something like this. For every proposition about nature, in inductive or in, in scientific research, there's always some way we can test, and specifically some way we can falsify our hypotheses. So we say things like, uh, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, which in fact it does. Now if you have any doubt about that, let's just go to the lab, and I'll get out a Bunsen burner, I'll get out some water and a thermometer, and well, there we go, it boils at 100 degrees centigrade. What do you want me to say? Physics speaks with one voice, and we know how we get the answers. And if you have any doubt about anything that I claim to be a physical fact, I know how to go back and test it. Go to the lab. Now here's the problem. With Freud, even though he wants to hold on to this idea of scientific reduction to biochemical states, if you would ask Professor Freud, how do you know that in all dreams, when you have a dream about an unknown stranger, how do you know it's always your father? Well, you can't go to the lab and find that out. There's no test you could possibly do. So the scientific critics will say, well, look, if you can't test it, then it has the same status as, say, religion. Or if you want to be more charitable, the same status as literary criticism. It's one way of interpreting the world, but there's no way to insist and pound on the desk. This is the only way. There are actually a plurality of possible interpretations. Right? So it does, in other words, Freudian psychiatry does not speak with one voice the way we would like physics to speak. It offers us a plurality of possible hermeneutics, of possible perspectives. Right? This means that it is never going to get to that scientific certainty, or at least that scientific univocality, 
that most of us long for. So I think that the attempt to, to read this as a kind of scientific activity is just wrong. And it runs into all kinds of problems. For example, do you really analyze dreams in the way you analyze blood? I think it's a metaphorical sort of analysis. I know what you do when you analyze blood. You break it into its component chemical parts. It's not what you do when you analyze a dream. You don't put it into a centrifuge and whirl it around. What you do when you analyze a dream is that you, if Professor Freud or Dr. Freud asks you to free associate, and he uses free association as a way of kind of fishing for the, the translation scheme for your dream, in, uh, your dream's manifest content, into its latent content. And when he's fished enough and he feels like, like he can interpret your dream, then he's done. Now the difficulty is this. Freud himself said the dreams were a product of the product process called condensation. We get lots of different things and symbolize them in one thing, like you know the alligator that was trying to eat me in my dream or something like that. Here's a difficulty. Assuming that we go for condensation and the correl correlative idea over determination, that my cr the crocodile in my dream was, the cause of, was caused by many feelings that I have, how do we know we, that we, when we've exhausted the interpretation of this dream? It's an endless process, literally. The re in practice, the way, you know, the way Professor Freud knew that he had finished interpreting a dream is when he said he was finished. <laughs> I, now I understand the dream, and now it's interpreted. The question is, different psychologists using different questions in free association might come up with different interpretations because it's overdetermined. You never get to the end of interpreting any one dream. So there's no way of knowing how to logically close this off. Near, this points to something that I want to, to emphasize, uh, Aristotle's idea of phrenesis. Aristotle, great philosopher, thought that all moral judgment involves something called phrenesis, which is translated into English as judgment. In other words, you have to have a certain amount of judgment. There's no one formula for right and wrong. I mean, we can get some, certain parameters to it, but w the nitty-gritty of it resists formulaic treatment. Well, may I suggest that psychoanalysis is the same kind of thing? It involves a certain kind of judgment. And I wouldn't want anybody to become a psychoanalyst that didn't have what I would describe as good judgment. But the, the difficulty is, is that I can imagine people having good judgment but not completely agreeing about everything. All right? And what that means is that we can never eliminate the phrenesis, the subjective element to psychoanalysis. This is another th reason why it resists the possibility of being turned into a hard shell natural science. My estimation is that Freud grew up in late 19th century German-speaking Europe and developed in early 20th century German-speaking Europe at a time and a place where science was at its all-time epistemological high. Everybody genuflected you know, to the shrine of science. What I think Freud did was kind of metaphorically put on the white lab coat so he could get his treatment of the internal facts of the psyche taken seriously. Right? I think that it is a mistake to try and do that now. When we look back on it, most of the claims won't work if we want to read it as a, a scientific activity. Part of this problem comes from the German word science, too. I guess I should note this. Uh, those of you who have the German, uh, the word for science is Wissenschaft. And in English, we call science science. Now, when we talk about science nowadays, in just in common, ordinary language, English, the uh, way we use it, um, we mean things like physics and chemistry, maybe biology and astronomy and things like that. We don't mean things like literary criticism. Usually we wouldn't call that a science. And most people wouldn't call theology a science, right? whatever you want to call it. Well, in German, it doesn't work that way. They don't parse knowledge like that. The German word Wissenschaft means an organized body of knowledge. That includes things like physics and chemistry and astronomy. But for the Germans, there's also things like Literaturwissenschaft, which is literary criticism in our language. There's also Theologiewissenschaft, theological science. In that sense of the word science, yes, psychoanalysis and whole Freud's whole project is scientific. It's an organized body of knowledge, in the sense that literary criticism is an organized body of knowledge. But like literary criticism, it is multivocal. It is, a, it is a, a system of interpreting things which does not exclude the possibility of other systematic interpretations. It is like literary criticism or theology. Right? In that sense, it is scientific. It is not scientific in the sense that physics is scientific. The unconscious is not an entity in the sense that the liver is an entity. Right? When you stop making those category mistakes, you can begin to really appreciate what a great thinker Freud is. Right? Because he's talking about something, the internal contents of our psyche, that just resists strict, hard shell scientific discussion. In other words, I know what it's like to talk about atoms or chemicals, because they're out there and they're in the public domain and so is language. When I start to talk about my fears, my loves, my hates, my dreams, my lusts, all that kind of stuff, I'm taking something that's private and internal and trying and making it external. And the problem is that language has a very hard time making the jump from what's inside me to what's outside here. Right? This intrinsically and always generates a certain degree of ambiguity. And it also generates a certain ca uh, category of entities for which 
our speaker is going to have a hard time giving a satisfactory scientific account. Well, what's a good scientific account of guilt or lust? I mean, I'm, I, I think it's a regulative rule a thousand centuries from now we may find out that it's a chemical. But between now and then, what are we supposed to do? A very sensible observation. So what Freud is trying to do is offer us a Wissenschaft of the mind, an organized body of knowledge which interprets things that have previously not been interpreted and which also brings together a range of phenomena which we might have thought were completely meaningless, like hand washing or dreams, and connects them all together with one universal or one general idea, one general concept. So what he does is bring together things we hadn't thought it was possible to bring together before. And that's what his great achievement is in my view. Now, uh, another problem that comes up here is where all this comes from. Let's be scientific about it for just a moment. Let's assume the facts of Darwinian evolution and that we started as amoebas and then turn into raccoons and then they turn into apes and they onward and upward and they eventually become us. Professor Freud never really accounts for where the psyche comes from. In other words, I assume that amoebas don't have an Oedipus complex. And I'll work on the assumption that the great apes don't, although I, I really don't know. Right? Let's assume that it's restricted to human beings. Okay. At some point in time, apparently, human beings didn't have this. And then now they do. What I'd like is a satisfactory way of explaining how it is we come from not having it to having it. Where the hell does it come from? sensible set of thoughts. I mean, I can imagine things like uh, the sex drive, reproductive drives, that that may be instinctual and, and goes back a long way. But why is it that we among, or uh, which is a, I think a rare thing among animals, create things like incest taboos? Where does that come from? Well, Professor Freud tries to account for that in the thing called Totem and Taboos, 1914. He says, what happened is this. There was the primal family, the primal horde, and they killed the primal dad and had sex with the primal mom and gang raped the primal mom, actually. And out of their primal guilt, they constructed the primal incest taboo. Now, I know that sounds stupid, but it is stupid, and that's actually what he says. If you go back and look at totem and taboo, this has as much empirical reality as Santa Claus. There's no such thing as the primal horde. There's no such thing as, as the primal family. There's no such thing as the primal incest taboo. None of these things happened. It may be a kind of metaphorical way of accounting for this, but it's very implausible. And it's certainly the most poetic and least scientific part of this. In other words, for it can be kind of self-indulgent sometimes. And totem and taboo is certainly one of them. And he doesn't have any satisfactory way of accounting for where this mental stuff comes from and how it genetically, over time, develops this structure. So it would be nice if we could develop something like that. I don't quite know how we would go about doing that. Fi uh, let me look at my final observations here and kind of knock out a general set of thoughts about Freud. I think, first of all, we have to admit that you can't eliminate the element of phrenesis. You can't eliminate judgment from our discussion of the mind and from Freud's discussion, a psychoanalytic interpretation of the human psyche. Um, that means that it's multivocal, not univocal. And that means that it is a hermeneutic, a set of principles of interpretation, not any kind of scientific activity. If you look at it as a, set of, uh, as a way of interpreting human behavior, then it's actually fruitful and quite insightful. You can find out quite a bit about people, and you would know a lot about my psyche if I were to say, well, Professor Fraud rather than Professor Freud, if I were to make that kind of Freudian slip. But here's the difficulty that we're going to find, or one of the difficulties. When I was typing up this, the outline for this lecture, I made lots of typing mistakes. Are all my typing mistakes parapraxies? I mean, are they all messages from my unconscious? That's kind of hard to believe, because some of them were just stupid. They didn't mean anything. I mean, they were just like, you know, T-R-E instead of T-H-E. What does that mean? I don't know. Now, maybe we're committed to the Procrustean idea that it all means something, but I don't know how you would find that out. That seems completely dogmatic. And if the opposite is true, that only some of my mistakes are parapraxies, which are messages from the unconscious, the question remains then, which ones? And if we don't have one way of finding out which ones, well then, it's a kind of phrenesis. You know, you'd, you interpret this as being a message from the unconscious, and this is not. As Freud says, sometimes a cigar is a cigar. Well, okay. The difficulty is, is that what we get here is a relatively mushy kind of a system, which would long for the crystalline internal coherence, the univocality of physics, and never gets it. Freud, I think, is one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. I know that that's an unusual um, reading, and I know it may be thought of as a denigration of Freud, and I don't intend it that way. What I mean, of, what I mean the way I mean it is this. I think that it represents um, something that you can really learn. I think you can learn things from literature. I think you can learn things from poetry. I think that the people that want this to be a science are the ones who think that really all knowledge is physics. I think that's just wrong. Just plain wrong. You're never going to find out about guilt and good and evil and love and hate from physics. That's just the way it is. You can find things that, like that out, 
but we find that thing, uh, things like that in a poetic way through literature. What this is is one of the great literary achievements of the 20th century. He invented a new kind of lyric poetry. We talk about love and emotion and stuff like that in a way which shows the influence of 19th century German scientific philosophy. So he tries to force the stuff of lyric poetry into the form of 19th century German positivism. What you get is a very influential but highly, um, highly, uh, how can I put it, a system with many great internal contradictions and internal tensions. The richness and greatness of Freud's achievement lies in the fact that he found these contradictions fruitful rather than sterile. He found them a road inward rather than a dead end to nowhere.